Okay, I think we're ready and we're here. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Diane Gerardo and the first lecture of our spring lecture series. I think that it's fitting to begin a series with someone who possesses a regional sensibility. And certainly, Diane Gerardo has influenced the unique integration between architecture, urbanism, and the social realm that now characterizes our mindset in Los Angeles, both within and without the institution of SciArc. Diane Gerardo is a true educator, a full professor in the School of Architecture at USC, but also an educator to us architects and critics already practicing in the field. Whether through analyses of fascist Italian architecture, examinations of social and sexual inequality in architectural discourse, or canonical texts such as Out of Sight or Architecture After Modernism, Diane Gerardo's voice is one of correction, reminding us that architecture is also ultimately a social and economic practice. What we do has concrete effects on people and communities, and the ways we organize the spaces of our discipline resonate in the lived spaces of everyday life. In her take no prisoner style, Diane writes, quote, only when architects, critics, and historians accept the responsibility for building in all of its ramifications, will we approach an architecture of substance. Please join me in welcoming a woman of substance, Diane Gerardo. Thank you very much for such a lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be back at SciArc. Um, I've been at SciArc in the past. Some of you have come here too recently to know that in the 80s I taught a couple of courses on theory and criticism, and I also taught <clears throat> excuse me, a course one summer on movies, which was great fun for all of us. I'm not sure that anybody was convinced that we really discovered anything new, but we did have a great time. Um, so it's a pleasure, whoops, to be back tonight. I hope I can juggle all of these things here. Um, um, talking to you, I'll also, just to let you know, I'll actually be teaching a course here this summer, probably late July and August don't know exactly what the course will be, something about monuments and memory, and it will be maybe history with um, a charrette and maybe tied to um, one of the other summer courses. So I'm looking forward to that experience. <clears throat> the, I think the title of my lecture tonight, did you give the title? I didn't get the program. I didn't get your, um, I forget what the title was that I gave you anyway. So anyway. Um, <laughs> Tonight I'm talking to you about um, the city of Cape Town, South Africa, but what I'm really talking about is more generally, it's about how historians do work. One of the questions that I've asked myself um, numerous times over the past few years is whose histories are recounted in typical architectural and urban histories. In recent years, historians have begun to turn away from the kind of exclusive histories and studies of public and private patrician domains toward more inclusive histories. But the question is always, how do we do this? Much of my research in recent years has addressed women's spaces in Renaissance Italy, convents, the domestic setting, brothels, where because of the capriciousness with which documents have or have not survived a half a millennium, um, one has to cobble together apparently disparate bits of evidence to try to begin to get a picture of um, uh, from a variety of different sources. These kinds of spaces, brothels for example, were so common, so ordinary, so well known to the men who were typically writing about things in their cities that very little time or ink was spilled on describing them, documenting their construction, let alone their use and often even their location. So for this type of work there's lots of conjecture and guesswork involved but fortunately I've discovered that we don't have any remaining witnesses who can contradict the reconstructions that, um, that I come up with for example. Um, so that makes it rather convenient you have big lacunae in the documents you can't ask or answer certain questions so you can speculate. But what about more recent histories? In fact, one discovers that it is those living witnesses who can be the repositories of significant and otherwise unobtainable and 
and often extraordinarily crucial information about the construction, preservation, or adaptation of the built environment. Until about 10 years ago, could I have the first slide? Am, oh, am I meant to do these? Okay. And I turn them on too, if I just push it, they go on. Until about 10 years ago, little serious research was conducted on the architectural and urban history of 20th century Cape Town, South Africa. Largely, of course, because of the formal constraints um, imposed by the apartheid regime and the informal difficulties of obtaining access to relevant documents in archives and other official sources. Significant areas of the city remained excluded from serious scholarly investigation, but equally importantly, attitudes and ideas about parts of the city were seriously distorted by the political needs of a variety of interest groups. So tonight what I'm going to be talking about is the history of one small area in Cape Town. I'm showing you an aerial view. Um, uh, the, the area is called the Burkop in the western section of historic Cape Town and the fabrication of an identity for this part of the city during the apartheid era. I'm also going to be considering the nexus between personal interest and public policy and their impact on or its impact on the preservation of this area. Now, um, for those of you not familiar with Cape Town, I'm showing you this sort of air view. If I can step, what, yes? Until I were ready to use it, sure. I am going to use it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to step away from the microphone, but I have a very loud voice. That you can tell me, so I think um, this is Cable Mountain, which is the most significant topographical feature, I would say, other than the bay in Cape Town. Cable Mountain is so called because it's flat as a table, and people in Cape Town talk about it when it's covered with clouds. It has its tablecloth on it. Um, the area that we're talking about here is um, actually over here in the area of the Signal Hill. Um, and I'll be showing you closer up views, but this is just to show you the, um, well, that got in slightly, but nonetheless, you can see. Um, that's the harbor area, which is recently been redeveloped. This is the core of the store of Cape Town, after I said, I don't know, but that's the core of it. And then the boat pop extends up in this area. Um, and it spreads out then on the northeastern flanks of Signal Hill in the shadow of uh, Table Mountain, overlooking the city's historic building di business district. Um, according to contemporary historical constructions, the district includes four areas, um, Skotchekloof, Schönekloof, Stadsit, and the old Melee Quarter. But none of these names appear on um, official maps, except for Skotchekloof, which is the official name for the entire area. Now I'm going to, I'm going to show you two maps just to orient you. One, The first, the first three areas that I mentioned, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn that off, um, were named after farmsteads, um, which underwent transformation into residential districts. Um, Schoenekloof having been developed in the late 19th century, and Scotchkloof and Stotzig during and immediately following World War II. 
and um, some of these areas have monotonous modernist slabs that are rather tedious, um, erected for Cape Muslims during the 1940s as housing to replace slums that the city leveled as a result of a 1934 slum act. So this area, which is also, the Bokap is also known as the Old Malay Quarter, um, was bounded, I took the streets off of there, but anyway, it's the oldest inhabited section of the um, area of the Bokap, parts of which date back to the 17th century. Now, this is not an, um, an un a simple issue because just what constitutes today and what in the past constituted the Bokop or the Old Malay Quarter is hotly contested. The city was founded by the Dutch East Indies Company in 1652 and they issued land grants for um, allowing permanent settlement. This is the first map of um, Cape Town. Uh, from sometime in the 17th century. There's no date on it, but obviously the second half of the 17th century. Um, and Jan de Waal, uh, or de Waal purchased the land in Scotchacloof around 1760, about 100 years later. And then he erected several small rental houses, uh, the earliest such housing in the area that came to be known as the Bokop. This was also, and this is in 1818, so the area that we're talking about, again, is Here's the laser pointer here. Okay, this is where the Bokap is. Um, and this is the 1818 map. Um, he also, there were several slave lodges constructed in the area there, um, all of which disappeared after the British government abolished slavery in 1834. There is a former slave lodge in downtown Cape Town which is still standing. Um, and it was during this period in around eight, the 1830s, 40s, and 50s um, that there was massive construction of rental housing in the area, especially low-income housing. Um, and over the course then of the 19th century, the Bokap, which is um, off on um, this side, um, <clears throat> gradually became one of two major working class districts in Cape Town. Housing in narrow terraces snaked up the sides of Signal Hill, <coughs> excuse me, and former black and mixed race slaves mingled with the rest of the city's working class of European and Asian origins. The typical block form in the Bokap consisted of rows of narrow, uh, flat roof, single story flats with plastered facades. When they snaked down the hill, they often had basements. And then subsequently, sometimes second stories were added to them. The lack of timber of the appropriate length dictated roof spans and room widths. Um, and the poor quality of the bricks that were produced locally meant that um, the exterior walls and interior walls needed to be plastered, which gave the architecture some of um, the Cape's most characteristic features, not only these buildings but others as well. Um, and one sees these particularly in the Bokop where absentee landlords built rows upon rows of housing units significantly narrower than the typical houses elsewhere in the city. Aiming for cheaper housing, they also standardized things like windows and doors and eliminated decorative gables and parapets that one would find typically in the upper income areas. Some of the 18th century terraces did continue through the 19th century to exhibit typical Cape Dutch architectural details such as undulating parapets, two panel portals, and fixed upper sash and movable lower sash windows, actually in their thumb still today. But the arrival of the British at the end of the 18th century altered the style once again. And this was the introduction of the Georgian architecture um, with slim windows, panel doors, uh, panel double doors, and fan lights. And this is snaking up um, Signal Hill here. Um, <clears throat> By the end of the 19th century, new housing in the Bokap began to include pitched roofs, bay windows, cast iron work on balconies. Um, sorry about the quality of the slide. Um, and verandas at a time when a larger number of houses also became the property of their occupants. Um, I have a couple of images that show, you turn the projector off. These are images that um, I took with a digital camera and I 
the archives in uh, Cape Town showing historic um, images of the boat house. So you can see this, uh, the narrow streets. So what you had was a dense network of alleys and narrow, sometimes hidden passageways tying the houses in the Bokop together. In most houses, there's a central passageway, and I'll show you a view into one a bit later, that leads directly from the front door to the back door, the sort of thing that we would call almost like a shotgun today. Um, and then it opens, but in this case, it opens into a walled courtyard where the family could socialize in private. And on the front of the houses, the stoop faces the street and serves as the place where more public socializing could occur. This housing type extended through not only the smaller area that is today described as the Bokop, but also the traditional areas in, um, let's see, in this, this is probably the best place to show you. the mid 19th century forward. They were, they were working particularly because of the closeness to the docks. They were, many of them were working in the docks, but they worked in, um, in all sorts of areas. They were, they were domestic servants, there were um, uh, construction workers, all sorts of things. But it was, ba it was working class. It was definitely all working class. So the architectural texture of the Bokop to the west and the east of the street that's the Divider Street, which I didn't point out to you on the map, but anyway, um, it didn't differ throughout the 19th century, so much so that most documents from the city planning office in Cape Town refer to the entire area as the Bokop. And even those who live in the Bokop today are uncertain of the precise boundaries of the various sections of this part of Cape Town. So this is some of the um, balconies today. There's been a lot of gentrification, but the longer narrow windows, second story added gable on the top. Um, again, sorry about the slides, I have bad film and that was my one chance. So anyway, um, these are the, this is the Georgian um, influence being seen. Now these issues about where the boundaries are for the book hop are more than just academic ones. The melee quarter, which is what describes itself today as the Bokop, situated between, specifically between Whale and Strand Streets, is asserted as the historic center of Muslim Cape Town and the heart of the Bokop, and as such is the, preservation, is the subject of a preservation campaign and the nexus of Muslim identity in Cape Town. Indeed, the controls exerted by um, Islamic religious leaders on its members in Cape Town and their manifest differences from the Christian community throughout the 19th, uh, 18th and 19th centuries encouraged them to cluster together in the city's working class areas where they could be called to prayer five times daily and where it would be easier to maintain their religious and social practices. Nonetheless, such designations leave um, the Vatican area, which is the one, the part of the Bokap that's closest to the docks, um, and the rest of Scotchacloof out of the equation. But equally importantly, they seriously distort the history of the district as a whole. Of equal import for the Bokap in the 19th century with respect to um, race was class. The working class which inhabited the small housing terraces such as you see in these images included mixes of race and ethnicity and also included lots of working class um, European whites such as people from Spain, from Portugal, from Italy. City officials from the second half of the 19th century through most of the 20th century found the book hap disturbing not only because of race but because it collected a mix of working class and unemployed poor 
and along with them a range of locales that the Good Burgers associated with vice them that we might find more interesting today. Um, bars and hotels, for example, were always getting negative press in Cape Town newspapers in the 19th century, places where, and I quote, a stream of moral pollution is constantly flowing. <clears throat> Even though there was um, an exodus of, and this is from, um, this is the area of the Vatican that I was mentioning that's closest to the docks, looking down over um, some of the docks and then the bay <clears throat> beyond and actually toward the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and this is uh, the center of Cape Town with um, the Bow Cop up sort of uh, to the northern section, or north on the map. I never get my coordinates correct down, and down below I can't quite sort out north, north and south. <clears throat> there was an exodus then of um, white residents uh, from the Bocop area once it began to fill up with newly emancipated colored and black slaves in the 1830s. But throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, until not too long ago, low-income white families continued to live there. The relations between the Muslim community and the Christian authorities um, in Cape Town were far from smooth until well into the 19th century. Cape Town authorities forbade the Muslim community to practice this religion. This is one of the shrines on Lion's Head. There went my water. <laughs> um, so secret meetings were held in the homes and um, of in individual members of the community and in an abandoned quarry along the flanks of Signal Hill. In 1886, city authorities forbade the Muslims from using their historic burial grounds, supposedly for reasons of public health because Cape Town was, um, had been hit by a smallpox ep epidemic a few years earlier. <laughs> So the Tana, um, Tana Baru, which means new ground, had long been the community's cemetery, um, parts of which dated back to 1805. The forcible closure prompted immediate disobedience, massive rebellion, riots that inflamed the city for days, and rallied the Muslim community against the government. And that was pretty much the only time that this happened in the city's history to, at this scale. For white Cape Town residents, class concerns intersected with racial fears prompted by the steady migration of black Africans to South Africa's urban areas. This is a familiar story to you. Throughout the 20th century, a series of laws tightened the grip of the white minority over colored and black South Africans, and this was particularly exp expressed in spatial control. In 1923, the Native Urban Areas Act forbade black Africans from owning land anywhere except in rural areas. By contrast with the laws regarding blacks, control over other racial groups varied throughout South Africa. The fear of Cape colored and what are the people who are described as Cape colored still today, who are mixed race, um, uh, many different mixes, <clears throat> but not rural blacks who've moved into the city. In India, the fear that, uh, that Indians and the Cape Colored would move into white areas finally spurred the enactment of the Group Areas Act in 1950, which instituted a formal policy of separating races in different areas. And these are some of the rural areas where black Africans were allowed to live. Um, and these um, acts that were associated with the Group Areas Act were not simply neutral statements about racial separation. They served as the legal pretext for forcibly classifying and separating the different racial groups. Um, and as they were implemented, the effect on families and individuals was devastating. What I'm showing you here is a rather more prosperous suburb. If any of you noticed, there was a... Um, a 60s radical recently arrested in South Africa and in the, it was actually in this suburb, Claremont, and it's characterized by these high walls, there's razor wire which you can't really see in this particular image but razor wire and cameras and all sorts of um, efforts to keep people out. Um, and this is quite typical also the sort of um, endemic signs that we see also here. Um, under the color of this purportedly legal system, between 1950 and 1984, in Cape Town, over 126,000 families were forced to abandon their homes and their business and move to the Cape Flats. You see the Cape Flats here um, and the other side of Table Mountain. Cars arrived in the neighborhood, informants told us, with the GG license plate meaning government, and individual families were pressured to move out. 
Although many said they would not go, as one of the former residents, um, Pedro Meyer, describes it, all of a sudden one day their houses would suddenly be empty. The families um, would have moved to the Cape Flats. This is uh, Mitchell's Plain um, and a family that moved to Mitchell's Plain from this area. A combination of threats and quiet harassment ultimately convinced people to leave. The black Africans were the first to go from the Bocap area. They lived throughout the Bocap. They lived in all parts of it, but throughout the 1960s they were steadily removed. We finally got access to some of the government documents, so a typical case is, for example, Mrs. Miriam Bacana ran a small hotel for 14 Bantu, and black, rural black Africans were um, termed Bantu at the time laborers on Dixon Street. In 1963, the city's director of Bantu administration notified the town clerk that since new housing was being made available for the Bantu in the Cape Flats, her license would not be renewed to run a hotel. Furthermore, she and her husband, who were Cape colored, would also be required to move to Guguletu Bantu Township according to the provisions of the Natives Urban Areas Consolidation Act. Once the black Africans had been removed, attention then turned more directly to the colored population. And I'm showing you other views of the Cape Flats. Some of these areas have simply informal housing for rural black Africans. This is Philippi. Um, a slow, bureaucratic, and legalistic process, which is quite remarkable to trace, um, in which denying residents and business permits ultimately gave a kind of spurious legitimacy to the racist program. The owner of a small grocery store in um, the Bocap at the end of Loader Street recalled how up until 1969 there had been 13 shops just very close to his shop. But in 2000, this is the only shop that remained in the area. Although a Muslim who continued to live in his shop in defiance of the law, Mr. Ali managed to resist the pressure to move even after officials attempted to claim that he had no business permit. He showed them his original business permit, which also included a small hotel above the shop, and which gave him semi-legal grounds. This was supposedly a hotel, but he actually occupied it with his family. Mr. Ali purchased the property in defiance of laws forbidding such ownership to colored people through subterfuge. An elderly gay man who lived nearby held 50, agreed to um, put his name on 51% of the title in a fictitious company, while Mr. Ali held the other 49% in his name, although in fact he um, controlled it all. Prior to apartheid, there had been no such thing or no such issue as a colored identity. As informants repeatedly asserted in interviews, those who were wealthy enough could move up in society, and so could those who were pale enough to pass. Most families had branches which intermarried with people of different races and ethnicities, which were only defined as white, colored and native in 1950. And this is um, one of the signs that still remains in the District 6 Museum in Cape Town. In the same year, the Population Registration Act required all South Africans to be classified according to race, and there were only three options, white, colored, native. Um, this was a necessary component of the Group Areas Act, of course, for if races could not be isolated, for races could not be isolated if race was not a fixed component of an individual's identity. In 1953, the Separate Amenities Act ensured that facilities would clearly be defined as being available to a particular racial group, and it made the clear distinction between white, colored, and black. These legal props for apartheid led to the 40-year effort to clear the black and colored South African population out of areas reserved for whites and to the creation of a ring of townships spreading out in the Cape Flats south of the city. They also led to the destruction of some of the city's oldest and most richly textured urban districts, such as District 6, and to the fundamental transformation of others, such as the Bokap. Um, could you vote? Yeah, thank you. Uh, District 6 is probably the most famous of the areas that was um, destroyed or leveled. It's all of this 
um, green area. It was, it included these areas. The only things that remained were the churches and then um, a university was built on one part of the site. Just recently, last year in fact, the South African government returned ownership of the land to the original owners who had moved out to the flats some 30 or 40 years ago. Um, although this in itself raised all sorts of difficulties. Uh, um, depends on whether what kind of transportation you have. Um, um, Mile-wise, it varies because they extend out very, very, very far. Um, but you're talking on a fast car trip. You're talking at least a half an hour with with no bad traffic. Um, and they don't have a public they don't have a public transportation system to speak of in Cape Town. What they do have are these private taxis, which are vans. Um, it's actually one of the most I, I've ridden in them. They're they're really quite amazing. They drive along their vans, and they're meant to hold eight people, and they typically hold. 20. Um, and you have the driver and then you have a person who leans out the window on the other side and yells out their destination, Google to Langa, uh, or whatever other parts of the city they go to because they don't only go to the flats. And then and they come along the most traveled areas and people know that sooner or later one of these will be coming along. Not actually all that long and they're very cheap so this is how most of the people in the townships who don't have cars get to and from um, their jobs. Already by the 1930s, an awareness of the poor physical condition of the Bokhaps buildings converged with fears about crime, disorder, infectious diseases, and racial, racial mixing, setting in motion movements to eradicate the slums. This, it's clear, was a worldwide phenomenon because the same phenomenon was occurring in the United States at the same time. It was occurring throughout Europe. It's quite remarkable how um, just as privatization became the watchword of the rest of the world in the 1990s, um, slum clearance was the watchword in the 30s. While the public rationales for slum clearance named the bad effects upon slum dwellers of unhealthful conditions in substandard housing, the judgments in fact concerned the effect of slums on the population that didn't live there. One of the areas designated for urban renewal was the Burkhop along with District 6 and the area between the Burkhop and the docks which is known as Devatikund. The latter was the first to go, um, but because no replacement housing was provided, was intended to be the first to go, was provided when demolition began, residents crowded into other areas, replicating and even worsening the very conditions slum removal was designed to cure. The dubious success of this first program significantly slowed implementation of slum removal in other parts of the city, but the city council nonetheless showed a marked determination for proceeding um, to buy up uh, so-called derelict housing in the old melee quarter and to plan for the rows of tenement flats that it ultimately built in the Scotchacloof. World War II intervened and forced city officials to place plans on hold until after the war. Although the process of dismantling the mixed race urban areas dates back to the slum removal campaigns of the 1930s, it heated up after the 1948 elections that brought the Nationalist Party to power in South Africa, when apartheid became formal public policy. In turn, the assault on the working class racially mixed district also triggered a response from members of the white community who wanted to preserve the urban texture of the area known as the, as the Bokop. The history of the Bokop becomes becomes increasingly complex as efforts to preserve it as a melee quarter were in fact led by a white man, an Afrikaans writer and poet, I.D. Duplessis. Beginning in the late 1940s, Duplessis spearheaded a campaign to recognize a section of the Burkhap as the historic melee quarter, not because of distinguished architecture, but he argued on cultural grounds. That is, because of what he believed was a historic community which had continuously inhabited the area for 200 years. Duplessis was the man, the individual, because he held a government post and he was actually in charge of the um, implementation of the Group Areas Act in Cape Town. He was responsible for designating the Bokap as the area between, well they pronounce it Chiapini, but it should be Chiapini and Rose Streets from Whale to Strand. From the 1930s forward, Duplessis aggressively led the campaign for the preservation of the Bokap as an exclusively melee quarter. Um, his role first as the Secretary of Colored Affairs in the first apartheid cabinet after the 1948 Nationalist Party victory gave him th that 
particular role gave him the initial clout to see that his goals were achieved. The book hop in the end was not leveled as District 6 had been. What up until the end of the 1930s had been repeatedly reviled in the press as a slum became all of a sudden from the 1940s forward a quaint and picturesque corner of Cape Town whose identity needed to be preserved. In order to preserve the Bocop, however, Duplessis had to construct a narrative that would support this objective. In an era when the goal was to achieve complete racial apartheid through the Group Areas Act, preserving the Bocop as Muslim or Malay neatly resolved the problem. This was an area that would be all Muslim, all Malay, um, all colored, as it were. Duplessis could claim that the colored population was just being kept in one district, just as the Group Areas Act required, while at the same time the small-scale neighborhood was being retained with its picturesque houses and abundant street life. Ahmad Davids, who is a, or he is a historian actually of the Muslim community, defined, um, observed, he says that the Muslim community defined as Cape Malay were encouraged to see themselves as the elite among an otherwise oppressed group. In other words, as above the black Africans and above other coloreds in Cape Town. That is the highest, the elite among the coloreds. And that indeed, he says, since 1925, they had sought the designation of a Malay identity that separated and raised them above people of Indian, African, and other mixed descent. An article in a resistance newspaper, The Torch, from March of 1952, praised the Cape Malays as being more civilized than and distinct from, and I quote, the savage and benighted blacks, even though the latter were often Christian. Duplessis finally achieved his objective in 1957 when the swath of the territory today known as the Bocap was designated a Malay group area. And historians such as um, Jeppe argue that this was part of Duplessis' strategy as Secretary of Colored Affairs to ensure that a policy of divide and rule was achieved in a local setting. The story is actually more complicated than can be explained by the written history, but even the recorded history is intriguing. By framing themselves as an elite among the far more numerous colored and black groups, the Muslims, or Malay people, did not see their fates as intertwined with those of the other groups, and hence they separated themselves politically from them, something that continues even today, by the way. Cape Town is the only place in post-apartheid South Africa where the National Party continues to be elected to govern the city. Of course, groups within the colored population also saw themselves as superior to the native or black population and likewise have not always seen their struggles as allied, although many are trying to see, this, see this, their struggles as um, linked together. Therefore, the preservation of the Bokap required the removal of all non-Muslim pe colored people. Pedro Meyer reported that some colored people converted to Islam in order to apply for residence permits in the Bokap where they had their housing, but generally the removal of the non-Muslim population was an unrelenting and ongoing process. In terms of the urban and preservation programs being advanced for the Bokap, this meant that other groups had to be removed from this area if Malay identity was to be maintained. Duplessis warned repeatedly about the danger that the community faced from the presence of other groups, and before the Group Areas Act, particularly the native population, which he argued was eroding the strong Muslim community. In 1944, and this was before um, apartheid in the 1948 election, he wrote, and I quote, Shabins. Shabins typically are small taverns privately run. They were illegal because blacks and colors were not supposed to be drinking. And they're found throughout the townships, um, often actually run by women. So he writes, Shabins have sprung up in clusters. Wine is brought in from Monday to Saturday by runners. Daga, or dope, smokers make the Malay quarter unsafe. And an influx of natives has added to the housing problems of the Malays. Any renovation should lead to saving the most picturesque part of the city and preserving for some of the Malays a place which enables them to live according to their customs. So to protect the Bokap, Duplessis fought both the city council and the steady encroachment of 
commercial development that pressed upwards from the main street, Butengracht, just as it had already swept through most of the blocks north of Long Street, which is one of the main streets in downtown Cape Town, throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Despite his best efforts, however, some of the properties which the council purchased from the 1930s on were leveled, and the blocks were redrawn to accommodate commercial uses in 1961. And even though it was designated as a group areas uh, as a group area in 1957, um, even though the book cap was de designated this in 1957, the mayor's office was still declaring that other than the first 17 houses that were renovated in 1950, the rest of the housing stock was dilapidated, it was slums, and it needed to be torn down. Duplessis argued that because of the charm, and these are his words, the charm which time had, had bestowed on them, the original building should actually remain and be renovated as a far more appealing draw for tourists. In July of 1957, the council finally um, yielded to his demands and issued a proclamation limiting all future development to residential use, effectively terminating the threat of commercial development. A tug of war about restoration then ensued, which continued throughout the 1980s. Residents tried to get assistance to renovate uh, their houses, assistance that was largely not forthcoming. The council wasn't eager to pay money to uh, people in the colored community. Between 1970 and 1976, 52 units were renovated in the core of the Bokap. In 1985, a third group was slated. This last group of buildings was actually slated for renovation, but then it, they were also put on the open market for sale at prices far higher than people who were already, the working class families in the Bokop could have afforded. Um, I think this is where, yes, I'm showing you, not such great slides, but this is an interior of one of these houses that was then um, sold, renovated and sold. It was actually then redone by an architect, which is why I was inside of it. And this is, this is it goes from the street uh, to the back. Um, very narrow, um, both floors the same way. And so everything is in this long, narrow um, section in the center. That's it, what you see is the width of the house. To return to the issue of the community's identity, I remarked earlier that Duplessis had to construct a narrative about the originary melee character of the Bokap, which necessarily entailed eliminating or downplaying the historic presence of other low-income or working-class groups. The other groups, Filipino, African, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and others defined as colored, were eliminated from the histories that Duplessis wrote, and he did write histories of the area, and they're still absent from the discourse today. Street names such as Chiappini Street sometimes testify to the origins of the people who lived there, but elsewhere their presence has been completely erased. Narratives presented by local Muslims and Muslim tour guides emphasize that today's Malay residents followed their imams to Cape Town when the Dutch removed them from Indonesia, especially Java, and then imprisoned their leaders often on Robben Island, which is of course where Mandela was in prison for so long. In their stories, in the stories of these guides um, and um, um, Muslim residents, an unbroken tradition from the late 17th century up to today binds the Muslims to the Bokap. The inhabitants of the early slave lodges in the Bokap did include Muslims from Indonesia, but they also included slaves from elsewhere in Africa, Sri Lanka, and India, and were followed by other groups. Likewise, the Bokap Museum documents the lives of the Muslim families in the Bokap, but completely ignores the presence of other groups. Just three blocks over from Whale Street, for example, where the Bokap Museum is located, is an area that was not settled by Muslims, but by people from the island of St. Helena, who are Anglicans. Their descendants mingled freely with the Muslim population, and indeed in the second half of the 20th century, the most prominent and sought after midwife in the Bokap is actually an Anglican woman from this community. The houses on Bloom Street and its surroundings with the Anglican Church of St. Paul's are in general much smaller than those on Whale Street in the Bokap and have not benefited from the renovation funds that spruced up other parts of the Bokap. One hotly debated issue in recent years is the question of who built the housing in the Bokap. And the Malay uh, or the Muslim community tries to argue that it was um, only the um, slaves from Southeast Asia, the Muslim slaves, who worked there. But um, there's pretty good evidence that there were lots of different um, prisoners and working class people involved in working on the buildings. The section of the Bokap between um, Loader Street and the docks 
um, today known as the Vatican, is part of the historic working class Bokap district, even though Duplessis excluded it from the borders that he drew for the Bokap. The Vatican has only been recognized as a distinct area in its own right in the last decade, when most of the renovations have been completed and has become the public center of gay culture. Only the removal of the colored population from this area as well during the 60s and 70s made it possible for this new group to move in and gentrify the Vatican. Much of the building stock remained in place and has been gentrified over the past three decades into an area of small, this is a bed and breakfast, um, hotels, bars, restaurants, and coffee shops. Um, it is truly the center of Cape Town's gay community with a full complement of clubs, bathhouses, theaters, galleries, and associated retail and commercial activities. Historically, the section of the Vatican known as Loader Street, because of its proximity to the docks, this is where you loaded things from, um, was known as a den of iniquity that was full of bars, brothels, and flop houses. A typical case of a building, whoops, this is uh, another gay club on, um, in the Vatican, uh, is the Manhattan Cafe, which was originally in the 18th century a house, then it became a hotel, a brothel, a bar, and now it's the Manhattan Cafe and restaurant. Although the polemics about vice in this area date back to the mid-19th century, perfectly respectable working class families from a variety of races and ethnicities continued to live and work in the area until the Group Areas Act and the forced removals of the 60s and 70s. Apparently there was a long-standing but generally quiet presence of a homosexual community in the Bokap. Remember that it was an elderly gay man who helped Ali purchase his um, grocery store with his fictitious corporation, even before World War II. Because these histories are, histories are not officially recorded, it's difficult to reconstruct them. But interviews with members of the gay community confirmed that the gay presence in the Vatican and the Bokap generally predates the recent gentrification of the Vatican. Although not known outside of the gay community, even I.D. Duplessis, who launched his campaign to preserve the Malay Quarter during the 1940s, was homosexual with a particular interest in um, a Malay man. The role of Duplessis' homosexuality and his personal connections to the Malay community has been completely, have been completely ignored in histories of the Bokap. But nonetheless, this is intriguing. Like many homosexuals of Western European descent in the last two centuries, Duplessis concealed his sexual preference. And like many others, he also gravitated toward men of a lower class and especially colored men. Just how this led him to fetishize Malay culture and Malay identity can't be reconstructed. He certainly left no documents. But in doing so, he managed to transform his personal fetish into an arm of state policy with the creation of a Malay identity and to marry this identity to a specific area, the Bokap. Perhaps this was only possible because his personal goals inter could be made to intersect with those of the National Party apartheid policy. But nonetheless, it's clear that Duplessis was largely responsible for designating the borders of the Bokap identifying it as a colored area and as one that should be preserved strictly for Malays. So it is finally then something of an irony that although the Muslim community refuses to recognize it as such, the center of the homosexual community in Cape Town is in fact part of the historic BOCAP and is in fact responsible for its preservation. It has an identical urban fabric and a comparable history of diverse architectural influences and a convergence of the personal um, and the public through the activities of Duplessis. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Happy to entertain any questions. I should probably preface or conclude my, follow my remarks, postface my remarks, um, with the note that research on this area is continuing. I'm still working on it and I'm working with um, at least one student, but probably another group of students um, to document the history of the Vatican and the Bokap, this the other parts of the Bokap and their intersecting and common histories. Um, and it's one that's been completely ignored by the official history 
histories of um, Cape Town, both the histories generally and then the urban and architectural histories of the city. Yes. Um, it's like most things that have happened in my life, it's pure serendipity. Um, I was asked um, about three years ago, three or four years ago, to um, give a memorial lecture for a woman who, who was a faculty, who had been a faculty member at the University of Cape Town. I was asked by a student group that had funded a memorial lecture for her to come and give a lecture. Um, but. South Africa's far away, and so the chairman of the program, or the director of the program, asked me if I would be willing to teach a course on modern architecture for a month while I was there. And I said, gee, that sounds boring. Um, and I said, but I have a better idea. I said, why don't you give me a group of students and we'll figure out some part of the city of Cape Town, because I knew it had an interesting history, and then once they'd invited me, I did some reading on it. So we'll figure out a part of the city to work on, and we'll do some research on some part of the city for a group of, you know, they actually it was a group of about 20 students. And so I did this with a group of 20 students. Um, we identified, before I came, I relied upon the student group that had invited me to identify the area. They suggested the book up. They wanted to work on the Muslim area. But once I got there and started working with the students, I discovered the Vatican. And um, I had, one of the students was um, a gay student who was very eager, to, began to undertake this research and became quite enthusiastic about it. And he and I pretty much focused on that area. With the rest of the students, we did archival research on the mm, um, documentary history of some of the forced removals and the urban and um, architectural transformation of the area over a long period of time. But he and I focused on uh, the, the Vatican and its relationship to um, the, the book hub. So as a result of that, um, some of the students weren't real thrilled with doing this project. They didn't want to go to archives, didn't want to go to libraries, didn't want to hunt down maps. Uh, but some of them were actually quite enthusiastic and really got fired by the project. And this inspired the director to suggest that maybe we should develop a graduate um, um, M. Phil, I guess it's called, Masters of Philosophy, that would be a research-based degree. It would be a one and a half year master's where students would research and learn to research, um, study theory, and then we would work on certain areas of Cape Town and, the, and or the Cape Flats and document their architectural, urban, and social history together. So um, I went there again last year and worked out the program, which was, I mean, it's sort of a big task, the bureaucracy of the program. And then I'll be teaching in it uh, this year. We have a group of, they expected maybe six students and we have 15, so. So it's completely serendipity. It was born from my refusal to teach a one month class on modern architecture. <sighs> Dora. Um, the history the history that we studied goes from about the 40s to today and it was largely through interviews the next phase because this was only a month-long project so um, the next phase will be actually studying property ownership and transfers of property over a period of time and then trying to uncover any historical memory of the earlier period. But there's cert certainly in none of the official records in the newspapers and so forth do there appear 
Mm. Does there appear evidence of a vibrant gay community that was sort of open and relaxed? Um, it was, it's been my impression, and I don't consider myself really a historian of um, Afrikaans, South Africa, but the Afrikaans community was not particularly hospitable to deviant behavior of any sort, uh, particularly the gay community. And I understood, my understanding from those people that we interviewed was the historical memory of everything underground. Mind you, you know, the historical memory goes back 60 years. Um, but again, in the 40s and 50s, it was definitely underground. Also in the 60s, even the 70s and 80s, it was present, it was there, but it was certainly not as open as it became, um, and as, as it has become in the last 12, 15 years. <clears throat> And um, what we're hoping to do is try to understand something of that by trying to un figure out what areas from police reports and things where um, gay communities, sub-communities might have been located. Um, but in these areas, it's very interesting, they had um, parades every year that um, were called the Coon Parades. I don't know if anybody's heard of these. Um, and they were quite uh, lively. They were big celebrations in District 6 and in particular, but also in other parts of the city. And there was lots of cross-dressing. Um, Cape Town's gay community did participate in these uh, parades. Um, even in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s during the forced removals. But whether it went beyond that kind of participation, I don't know yet. Um, but they're interesting questions to ask. Yes? Yes. Well, the, the, um, sometimes they, well, they built housing for people that they removed from the city of Cape Town. But there was a constant stream of rural black Africans coming in, and those are the ones who built the makeshift housing. Um, the city did produce cement block houses. Um, remember the family that I showed you in front of the doorway? That was sort of the typical Mitchell's Plain housing, and there were blocks and blocks and rows and rows of these, and they're still there. Uh, Mitchell's Plain, Philippi, Brown's Farm, Langa. I mean, and then others were um, extended and built uh, over time. I mean, the group, the removals continued 50s, 60s, 70s, whenever they could try to force somebody out or whenever they detected somebody, they moved them out. The process could be very slow, <clears throat> but it was effective. Yes? <clears throat> 